Oh, hey. Okay, there we go. Um, also, I apologize, trigger warning, there is going to be a rainbow pinwheel of death on all of my slides. Bonus, when you get the slides at the end, you can actually go through them really fast and it will animate. So, welcome to Load Balancing for Humans 2 Electric Boogaloo, or How to Survive in Tech. I am Vanessa White, and I gave this talk here last year. This is slightly different than last year's. Um, I'm also in a new job role, so I'm no longer an IT person. I am actually a software support engineer over at Papercut now. Um, I'm Mackerel84 on Twitter, Freenode, and Slack. We also have Slack cards up here in the front if you have not yet joined. Maybe you will be the lucky 600th member. Uh, before we get started, I am not a lawyer. I am not a doctor. This is all advice from me. Do not take this as rote scripture or anything like that. This is just advice. What I am is a geek. I'm coping the best I can. I hope my talk can help you. If not, at least hopefully you'll laugh a little bit. And before we get started, how many folks in this room have read Time Management for Systems Administrators at this point? OK. Congratulations, you win a prize. I don't know what, um, but we'll find you something. So if you have not read this book, this is the single greatest book on how to manage your time when you're working in a tech field. I am entirely serious. We will stop right here for a couple minutes. If you are actually on the Wi-Fi and you can get to Amazon or to the iBook store, I would recommend ordering this right now. Or take a picture of the slide or remember it. This is a wonderful, wonderful book. I cannot distill down everything that's in this book. It's really short, but it's really useful, and it's really compacted. OK. Everybody good? Also, there will be audience participation. I know that's really brutal at 9 in the morning. I'm sorry. All right, so some key terms. Who here has heard of a boff before? OK. So for the unfamiliar, a boff is a bastard operator from hell. This is Dennis Nedry in Jurassic Park. Um, these are the folks who make everyone else hate IT departments. They are why we cannot have nice things. On the other side, there is the PEBCAC, aka problem exists between keyboard and chair, also known as a layer 8 issue on the OSI model, an ID 10.7. Um, losers. These are the end users. These are the folks you have to support. Hopefully you are not in a situation where you constantly view them as PEBCACs. GUI. Everyone knows what a GUI is, right? Graphic user interface. That's what we live in 90% of the time. CLI, command line interface. This is the substructures that run all of Unix underneath Mac OS X. This is what runs Linux. This is what makes most of the world work, except for Windows because it doesn't have a real shell. Grok. Who here has heard of Grok? OK, for the folks who have not heard of Grok or who are too unawake to raise their hands, Grok is understanding on a deep innate level. This is when you've got your 10,000 hours. This is when you know things inside and out. This is where I was at with classic Mac OS after growing up troubleshooting my Performa. Um, customers, someone you support infrequently. Users, folks who you support on a weekly basis. Coworkers, folks you interact with on a daily basis. This is just a way I have of referring to folks. Um, I don't technically have users anymore because I'm a software support engineer now, so I only have customers and coworkers. Um, in the regular IT world, you usually have users. They're the folks who come and talk to you constantly. So a couple main themes of my talk, knowing your users, enjoying your work, knowing your limits, learning to cope, and general advice and final thoughts. So we'll start with part one, knowing your users. Why is it important to know your users? Knowing what they need, speaking the same language, Whedon's Law, tickets, and knowing your coworkers. So why you should get to know your users so you can better fulfill their needs, have a degree of witty banter, and build social trust between techs and users. How many folks have worked in an environment where your users thought you were the devil? OK, <laughs> this is what we're trying to combat by getting to know them. It's really, really hard if you come into an already negative situation to fix it. It takes a lot of very gentle hand-holding. And no, it's totally OK. You can totally do this. It's talking in soft tones like you're talking to a freaked out animal. It's fixable, but it's hard. It's totally worth it, though, because once you start fixing that, they'll actually come to you when they have problems. They won't hide in the corner and wait till their computer's caught on fire. They will bring you the, hey, I can't get into my email. I think something might be wrong with my directory account. Knowing what they need. 
So knowing your environment will make your job so much better. If you're supporting graphic designers, you have a totally different set of issues that you're going to be taking care of than if you say support video engineers. Know the folks you're working for. Know what they know. If you can, go into their society and pick up some of the memes and cultural artifacts that they have. It will make your life a lot easier. And speak the same language. Um, and this year I'm bringing in the animated GIFs because Nick McSpanning couldn't make it. And I know he will get on my case for saying GIFs and not GIFs. So grok what they grok, how they grok it. Be able to explain things in a common argo or jargon. Or don't use argo and jargon at all if you can help it. And don't dumb things down. Explain things in simpler terms. It's not like you're explaining things to a child. They do know what you're talking about. They just don't know the names for it. So if they have no idea what mail is, tell them to go to the stamp in their dock or the stamp at the bottom of their screen if they don't even know what a dock is. Um, OK, I'm not dumbing things down. So how many folks watch Star Trek for? OK, everyone remembers when Scotty goes up and goes, hello, computer, into the mouse. He doesn't know how our computers work, but he absolutely knows all of the science and everything else. This is most of your users. They know the things that they're talking about. They just don't know what we know. We have to bridge that gap. We are the person there to help them and keep them going. So be a little bit nicer than McCoy was. Just, OK, there's a mouse and a keyboard. You can't talk to it. We didn't come 20 years, or 20 years later, so we'd be able to talk to Siri. Oh, no, 30 years later. I forgot. That's like 1985, right? All right. Whedon's Law. As the inestimable Will Whedon says, don't be a dick. Don't be mean. Be kind. Be gentle. Gentleness is repaid tenfold in respect. It may take a while for it to get through folks' skulls. It is entirely worth it. So applying Whedon's Law, strive to be friendly, open, and engaging with your users. You are not Dennis Nedry. Don't be a boff. However, you can explain that you're busy. If you are a regular, everyday IT person, you are getting pummeled from all sides with walk-ups and emails and requests on HipChat or Slack or whatever sort of messaging system you've got. Make sure that you set aside heads down time so you can actually work on your projects. And make sure folks know that it's coming. Put it in your calendar. Make sure it's marked down. Do get back to them, though. Don't forget about them. And the best way you can do that is with tickets. Does everyone have a ticketing system? Excellent. If you don't have a ticketing system, get one. Your inbox is not a ticketing system. Do not use it as such. If you get things into your inbox from users, forward them to the ticketing system. Take the time to reach out to the user and say, hey, so I love that you reached out to me, but really got to send them to the ticketing system. I will keep forwarding them over for you, but if I go on vacation, you're going to be out of luck until I get back and check my email. Tickets also equal trackable issues. So if your user start noticing something like, say, your network shares are going down, and it's happening with some degree of frequency, because you're, get, you're getting emails oh, every Monday morning from everyone in accounting because they can't access their share, tickets will tell you. You will be able to go back, look through, see what's breaking, figure it out. And it will tell you, what do you need to document better? If you're constantly getting issues of, how do I add the printer, probably a good idea to update your printer documentation. And the other side is know your coworkers. If you don't have any coworkers, if you're doing solo IT and you're not doing consulting as yourself, work on this. Having other people around so you can balance out the load makes it so much easier. And knowing each other's strengths and weaknesses and preferred type of work is the most helpful. I still get to work with this because I'm a software support engineer and I have coworkers. So we've got the guy who defected from Microsoft and he handles all of the weird Microsoft issues. We've got another one of my coworkers who absolutely knows Active Directory and scripting inside and out. Between them, they take all the really scary stuff and I get all the Mac and Linux tickets. So balancing the workload, if you have on-call responsibilities, make sure they shift. Do not get stuck on call for eight months the way I was. At two jobs ago. It was hell. I could not get more than 30 miles away from town because I had to get back if something caught on fire. And boy, howdy, did things like to catch on fire. Shore up knowledge gaps. Teach the other folks who work with the things you know. Have them teach you what you need to know. And 
have coworkers run through Wikidocs and make sure they're clear, concise, and helpful. That was covered yesterday in the talk that I did with Rich um, with wonderful and disastrous results on actually live troubleshooting documentation. Um, I highly recommend catching on YouTube if you missed it. So part two, enjoying your work. Hypothetical situations, ways to make things more entertaining, challenging yourself, challenges that I have put myself under, and documentation. If you like interacting with humans, if you like solving puzzles and fixing things, if you have skills beyond the ken of mortal humans, and you're occasionally pulling light hard pranks on folks, you're probably a really great candidate for working in tech. You can be a little bit like Q, do not constantly be like Q. I apologize for the rapid amount of Star Trek references I'm throwing out, it's my favorite. Um, if you did not answer yes to most of the previous questions, consider finding an exit plan and getting out of tech. And things are going to get a little bit nerdier than they already were. I know that's hard to believe, but making things fun is easily accomplished by turning things into a game. You are basically playing Myst every single day, but you've got a heck of a lot more knowledge behind it. It's not as bad as the frog trap in Riven. You can figure out what's going on around you because you know the computers you're working with, you know your environment. You can solve the problems a lot faster. You're also gaining more skills, so it's like changing classes and leveling up in an RPG. And you can also bring nerdy and geeky users into the game. So I used to actually send my users on quests and be like, okay, you want access to XYZ, you're gonna have to go out and you have to collect me the following items, including your manager's approval, a filled out form, and send me an email. And it worked out really, really well, and then they would bring me rewards for doing the quest, which is totally backwards of how it works in a real RPG, but it was fabulous. Um, <laughs> challenging yourself. So if you do have spare time at work, it's a really great thing to take some time out and actually do something new. Learning new things is how you stay relevant. If you stop learning things, you will be supporting 10 sick servers for the rest of your life. So block out some time and take the time to learn. I have a bad problem. I get really, really, really bored. Sometimes I think it's a really great idea to do something new and challenging. And so over the last five years, actually this goes over the last six years now, I have virtualized Mac OS 761 and 904 in Sheepshaver. I taught myself the Mac OS 10 command line. I learned Radbind. Poor, poor sweet Radbind, may it rest in peace. Um, hand built Nagios because I wasn't allowed to use Mac ports. Rebuilt a borked AFP home directory server. I came here to speak and spoke at a couple other things as well. And I set up bare metal vSphere Mac minis back before it was easy and ESXi 6 was out. So after half a decade of projects, I've come up with a system so that I can actually do things intelligently because I can't really recreate those cheap shaver VMs that I did all those years ago. So I'm gonna go over the ESXi Mac minis because unfortunately that was a year ago and that was the most recent thing I've actually completed. So my goal was to set up Mac minis that ran in vSphere. Um, so long story short, as supporting software engineers at New Relic, everyone had laptops None of them were constantly running. They had to take them home at the end of the night. They needed something that they could build things for iOS in Xcode. So that was why they needed the vSphere minis. So took it down to four stages. Research, hardware teardown, software setup, and refinement. Research was phase one. It took about a day. I got to go Google around. I was still available to my users. It worked out pretty well figured everything out, missed a couple blogs. Otherwise, I might have gone it done faster if I found Rich's blog in time. But I wasn't using my Google Foo properly. Phase two, tearing apart a Mac Mini. Um, how many folks here have taken apart a mid-2012 Mac Mini? OK. It's not hard. It's nowhere near as terrifying as taking apart a G3 iMac and possibly electrocuting yourself, <laughs> which I have done far too many times for my own sanity. But it's pretty easy. Um, do make sure that you follow the directions entirely. I'm not actually an Apple certified tech, so I was following the iFixit guide. I may have left the little light at the front unplugged on a couple of my Mac minis that I did. So make sure everything gets plugged back in properly. Software setup. I should not have done the software setup for ESXi while I was at work. I may have terrified my users at the time a little bit, running around wearing big headphones, listening to KMFDM, stomping like I was going to kill something, mostly because I kept running into the pink screen of death. 
um, which if you haven't played with ESXi, when it catastrophically fails, you get a pink screen of death. I, it was really seriously a solid day of going through, figuring out, okay, what do I need to do? And then I got to go through and refine things. So I fixed steps two and three and managed to cut it down to about three hours for the total setup because documentation is magic. Also, I've been meaning to use this ridiculous animated GIF of my little pony velociraptors forever. <laughs> I could not fit it in last year. Um, so documentation is magic. I did not mention that I was documenting everything as I went when I was doing my project. So I had a notepad and paper. I was taking screenshots. I was taking pictures with my phone for things that I couldn't screenshot. screenshot. I made sure I had way too much information about what I was doing because it makes it so much easier. You should always, always, always document as you go. If you're doing this once, you will do it again, unless you're doing something for someone you're never going to see again in your life for some reason, which is highly unlikely. Also, feel free to bring some levity to your initial documentation. If you are ready to rip the Linux out of ESXi, write that down. If you want to go stand in the server room and scream for an hour, if you can, do so. If not, write about it. And for examples of levity, documentation can indeed be human. Surprisingly, I found this inside of a man page for an OS X system called PMSET. Um, PMSET, if you're unfamiliar, is the power management stuff. This is what controls the sleep-wake cycles on laptops and desktops. Um, I think the only time I've ever heard of Phase 25 being used is by Rich, and that's for special stuff. But we do not recommend modifying hibernation settings. Any changes you make are not supported. If you choose to do so anyway, we recommend using one of these three settings. For your sake and mine, please don't use anything other than 0, 3, or 25. 0 is desktops, 3 is laptops, 25 is special. Um, that there's actually a little bit of human inside of a man page that's readable still blows my mind. How many folks have looked at a man page and just kind of gone, what? It's OK. We can admit it. There is no video of you being recorded. Uh, it's Whenever someone tells me to go, just go read the man page. It's totally self-evident. I'm just like, seriously? I'll just go see if Rich talks about it. <laughs> and then, all right, how many folks have been around since the 68K days? OK. so. Macintosh Tech Note 31, the dog cow. This was one of the last things that got added into the original Macintosh technical notes that were sent out to developers um, back in April of 1989. The dog cow is the Z character from the Cairo font set. And it was originally supposed to be a spot dog by Susan Carish Designs. But folks decided we'll make it a little bit fun. The dog cow ended up spreading through all sorts of things. So Buggy software builds on a whole bunch of the original Apple stuff were called Moofy. It's a little bit Moofy because it's not working right. And if you have not seen Tech Note 31, I will make sure that there is a link when I put the slides up. Um, too long, didn't read. Documentation, good. There is no such thing as bad documentation. There are such things as outdated documentation. There's obsolete documentation. But the only bad documentation is documentation that does not exist don't have bad documentation. Document all the things. The internet is fun, right? You get to spend all of your time playing around on the internet while you're documenting things. Enjoy it. Do not stay up till 3.17 in the morning documenting, though. Oh, it depends on what you're documenting. Sometimes you can get really great documentation at 3 in the morning, but <laughs> other times. All right, part three, knowing your limits, time management, staying healthy, burnout, compassion fatigue, and martyr syndrome. So that book I mentioned at the start, I'm going to keep shilling for it and drilling it into your heads. This is the book that saved me from going insane when I was getting my first sysadmin job. I don't know how, but my boss, boss had a copy of it sitting in his office. I don't think he ever read it. Or if he did, he forgot everything that was in it. It saved me. I was ready to cry and give up and go back to working retail. So get this book, read it. Document your time for a couple weeks. Figure out where you're losing your time. 
it has a wonderful, wonderful section on like, how do you block out your time for doing projects? How do you block out your time for doing regular tasks? Where do you write down what you're actually doing? This is also how, if you are working in an environment where there's only a couple t IT folks and they refuse to get you anyone else, you can say, look, I just did 60 hours of work this week. We absolutely need to get another person in here. It can be an intern. They can get paid minimum wage. They'll be happy for the work experience. Staying healthy. So how many folks have run into the stress burnout illness cycle? Okay. For those of you who haven't, you're very lucky. So get enough sleep, see your doctor, evaluate your diet. The stress and burnout are the parts that make our jobs the hardest. And going into burnout, how do you know when you have burnout? There's usually some pretty good personal signs. Usually it's involving getting tired, grumpy, and snapping in people. Once you know how you burn out, you can start working on inter counteracting it. So once you're burning out, start talking to your manager. Make sure that you can actually get time out of the office. If there is no leeway for getting time out of the office, consider finding a new job. Talk to your friends and family so that they know and can tell. They will know months before you know that you are falling apart. They will be able to say, hey, you're kind of spinning out. Now you need to calm down. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, make a burnout action plan. Try and figure out how long it takes for you to burn out. Get a plan to reverse it. Extract yourself from stressful situations. So if that user from finances comes over and starts screaming at you because they don't know what happened to that one icon in their dock, just politely bow out, go to the server room, have a good scream. Burn out gracefully. Do Apache CTLK graceful, not kill nine. Apache CTLK graceful is when you slowly, gently take down your Apache server and then bring it back up. Kill nine is just bam, shut down. It's like running halt. Everything just turns off. So for an example, burn out and me. After the conference last year, I kind of started to go on this horrible, horrible hell spiral that was almost as fast as Mad Max Fury Road. Things just kept going and going and going and going and work kept getting more and more and more and more and they changed all of my job title and I absolutely burnt out. I, about a week after I went to MacTech, I crashed hard. They may have also tried to make me work on the weekend. That was my birthday and that didn't help at all. So I went, overboard. I had something to do with finding a new job. <laughs> Carrying on. Compassion fatigue. Who here has heard of compassion fatigue? Okay. For everyone else, compassion fatigue is essentially the emotional version of burnout. If you work with end users, if you work with customers, they will push so much emotional baggage on you. It's not even funny. They will come crying. They will come screaming. This is what doctors deal with constantly. It's why doctors can be so ridiculously cold when you don't feel good. You will stop feeling. You will stop caring. It gets even worse if you have depression. It is a miserable state to be in. Figure out what you can do to extract yourself from it. Figure out how you can get back. It's an entirely personal journey. I cannot give you any advice on what will work for you. I am sorry. Martyr syndrome. Who here knows what martyr syndrome is? Okay. So, martyr syndrome is, they can't survive without me. Yeah, no, they totally can. In my experience, there are two different types of martyrs. There are passive martyrs and antagonistic martyrs. Passive martyrs are not boffs, usually. They may work for a boff. Um, if you've seen Jurassic World, Lowry, the new IT guy, is a passive martyr. You, I don't want to give things away. When you watch the movie, towards the end, it will make sense. If I go away, there will be no one to protect and save them. <laughs> no one will keep everything running. You will sacrifice all of your time trying to keep things going because they need you. This is not a good thing. On the other side, we've got antagonistic martyrs. These are usually your boss. These are the Dennis Nedrys of the world. They need me because no one else could possibly figure out how things work. No one else can do this right. These are also the folks who don't leave documentation beyond recipes. These are the folks who think the job security means not telling anyone else how things work. These are the folks who don't take a vacation for three years. You are not a martyr. 
I promise you, you are not a martyr. You are someone who goes to work and gets money. You do it for a set number of hours or maybe you're salaried, but it's still lock it in at 40 hours or lock it in at 50 hours. Do not work any more than that unless you absolutely have to. Do not give up your life and your happiness for work. If you do want to start sacrificing things, then do like random office sacrifices, like unbending a bunch of paper clips and laying them around in pentagons throughout your office. Um, learning to cope, because cat macros are not a valid coping mechanism. I also had a lot of fun trying to find a ridiculous cat macro. Um, last year it was a cat sitting in an old iMac shell saying, oh hi, is my house. So things to cope with. Uh, I apologize, there's going to be a little bit of 80 cyberpunk terminology in here. So wetware. This is anyone with a squishy brain thing. Software. OSs, software and services, hardware, servers, printers, and client machines. So I am not the best at dealing with humans. I never have been. I am just another nerd like all of y'all. I have some sort of weird ability to stand up here and talk in front of you, though. So be kind, be compassionate, don't talk down to people. Also, find the right workplace and user base for you. I can find the right user base pretty easily. Finding the right workplace with the right environment is the really, really hard part. Adapt, thrive, flourish, or GTFO. If you cannot fit where you currently are, just get out and find something new. There are other things, I promise you. Also, do not trust your brain. Your brain is a dirty liar. Your brain will tell you that you know everything. Your brain will tell you you don't need a wiki. It is lying. Do not trust it. Document everything. Put any event or meeting that you need to go to in your calendar because you will probably forget. And then your friends and your users and your boss will start going, what the heck is wrong with you? Come on, can't you make it to your meetings? Why didn't you make it to that dinner party? Make sure you actually document the things you're going to do. Fungibility. Um, this comes out of feminist philosophy and psychology. Fungibility is the ease at which you can replace something. It also comes from interchangeable parts. Um, you are not a cog in a machine. Your work may treat you like you're a cog in a machine. You are a human being. You have thoughts, you have emotions. It's really, really hard for folks to replace you, especially after you've been there for the while. Once you've got enough knowledge of your office, you can pretty much do things in your sleep. I mean, it doesn't get too hard. But do make sure that everyone is in a team. Do not work on your own. And onward, coping with stress. How many folks here get stressed out? OK. So just about every bad thing in life will come from stress, or stress will compound it. So find ways to relieve your stress. There are so many different ways to do this. The things that work for me probably won't work for you. So I, I don't know. You may enjoy driving around in a Jeep with the top off and listening to really loud music and possibly playing the Numma Numma song to troll people, um, this may or may not work for you. And you may or may not be able to drive around in a downtown metropolitan area where you can do that and have a whole bunch of nerds scream in horror. Uh, so other things that I can advise on, bastard operators from hell. They may have been humans. I'm still not sure that they're not some sort of weird changelings. So if you work with a boff or you're supporting a boff, or you have any near daily interaction with a boff. Run away. Get out while the getting is good. It will be so much better for you in the long run. Ah, dang it. Let me just accidentally skip too many slides. So how you know that you're dealing with a boff? They will snap at you. They will be sarcastic to the point of cruelty. They will belittle everyone. They will be absolutely brutal to users and techs alike. They won't write documentation, and they will have some variety of martyr syndrome. Coping with them is like playing Minesweeper. How many folks have actually won consistently at Minesweeper? Yes, if you're really careful, you can win at Minesweeper. But I mean, there is just a high likelihood with a boff, as with Minesweeper, that you're going to accidentally trigger them, and they're going to come unglued on you. So if you can't run away, which is probably likely, because jobs don't grow on trees, Talk to your manager or talk to someone further up the chain if they are your manager. Bringing up the fact that you're in a hostile, toxic workplace 
should hopefully help things. If it doesn't, that tells you a lot about where you're working. Be extremely careful around boffs. Try not to offend them. Do not poke the bear unless you absolutely have to. And if they're your coworker, try to lift some of the burden away from them unless they may already not be doing anything, um, which sometimes will happen. <laughs> so be aware, there will be probably some degree of lashing out. Try to help them. Be compassionate. They are, to some degree, another human being or used to be a human being. They may be able to come back. And if this is hitting a little bit too close to home, do keep the log of how much you're working. Figure out how much time you're spending at work every week. Figure out how much time you're on call. The odds are you have gone well and above 40 hours a week of stuff. Find a way to get rid of the stress and disconnect from work. Talk with your supervisor about fixing your workload if it's getting too bad. And you might be wondering why I can talk so much about being a boff. And this goes back a couple years to Christmas of 2012. How many folks were here last year for this talk? OK. Don't say anything. Who can guess what this is? It's a Microsoft Silverfish. What Windows pro what Microsoft product sounds really similar to Silverfish? So close that it might accidentally get autocorrected to Silverfish. Yes. Now, it's 8 p.m. on Christmas Day. I get a text message from the head of sales at the company I was working for saying, hey, Merry Christmas. So I can't install Microsoft Silverfish on my computer, and I really want to watch Netflix drunk on the couch with my wife. I'm like, gee, so you tried downloading it and you tried installing it, right? Yeah, it's not working. I'm like, huh, well, I'll reach out to the head of HR, who's my boss, and we'll see about getting that installed. I had been given explicit directions not to not allow this user to install anything on their machine. I do not lightly go in and modify settings in Etsy Auth so that you have an admin account, but you can't install apps, but I did this for that person. Oh, please, please, please don't bug HR. I'm the senior IT person at this company at this point. My time is worth so little that you will come in on Christmas and bug me. To be fair, I may have been watching an episode of Chopped where goat brains was one of the basket ingredients, and I may have been perfectly happy to have this text message conversation. But at that point, I knew. I was done with that company. I was done with that place. It kept getting worse. So what can we learn from the Microsoft Silverfish? Make sure your users respect you and your time. Make sure escalation policies are clear. Unless the building is on fire, do not contact IT on holidays or scheduled days off. An email would have been perfectly fine. There was no call to contact me on my personal cell phone. It was beyond rude. Make sure the other folks you're working with have your back and will back you up on this. I got thrown under the bus. It did not help. That was why I left. And remember, no one is going to canonize you in the saints of Macdom for being a martyr. There are no prizes for this. Do not be a martyr. Do not put up with this. And so I've had all sorts of fun further adventures in workplaces growing and changing and turning into horrible, stressful environments. And things may have changed at my last job where I was no longer a good fit. And when they start trotting out the cultural fit talk, it's a little bit painful and it's a little bit sad. And I still miss my old users. I worked with some of the most amazing software engineers. I worked with someone who was on the original Mac dev team. And I worked with the guy who invented the wiki. It was really sad to go. I did get to leave at the same time as the person from the Mac dev team. So I got to crash his going away party, which was pretty sweet. And so I headed over to Papercut. These are actually my coworkers who I work with back in Portland, Oregon. It's the most tiny office I've ever worked in. There's only eight of us in the Oregon office. Most everyone else is back in Melbourne, Australia. It is so much more fun, though. 
and I have no stress. I don't have to check my email when I'm not at work. They sent me happy words of encouragement. Hey, go have fun at your talk. Not realizing I was in the middle of my talk, but <laughs> it's so much better. I have been able to drop all of the stress out of my life. I can actually go to sleep at night now, except for when I'm prepping for conferences and freaking out because, oh geez, I have to get 100 slides done. It has improved my life drastically. If you are sad, if you are miserable, consider finding someplace new. You may end up finding a company where they will say, not only do we support the fact that you're active in the community, we're going to actually help you be active in the community. And by the way, you totally can admin Slack on the clock, no problem. And coping with software and operating systems, finding the right community, getting the right tools, and things to keep in mind. So finding the right community, congratulations. The Mac community is pretty much the best possible community to work in in all of tech. We are really, really good. We have our bumps, we have our warts, but we are so much better than, say, the DDWRT forums, which if you've ever tried to install new firmware on a router, you may have encountered. It's a little bit scary over there. I don't recommend visiting. Getting the right tools. Sign up for any and all dev mailing lists pertaining to things you support. Get an Apple developer account. Um, and I should have updated that slide from last year because the dev accounts actually give you access to OS X and iOS. So you can already be playing with El Capitan, AKA Snow Yosemite at this point. Um, so do testing on betas. What, Snow Yosemite? It's so much better. Uh, but Snow Yosemite is awesome. So I don't think El Capitan is a horrible name, but my first thought was Star Trek, which one? Star Trek V? Yeah, yeah. When Captain Kirk is climbing a mountain, why is he climbing a mountain? And I hope I didn't get that stuck in anyone's head. Um, anyway, so continuing on, do testing on the OS X betas as close to the launch as you can to make sure everything's actually working. Make sure that your deployment tools are working. Make sure that you can re-image things if you need to re-image them. Make sure that your software isn't falling over. For those of you who remember when the switch happened from 10.6 to 10.7 and suddenly half the apps didn't work because they were still PowerPC, make sure that you know about that. Also, for any mission critical stuff, set up production and testing environments. And if you have to adventure outside of our community, I would highly recommend reading How to Ask Questions the Smart Way. It was written by a boff. It's a little bit hard to read, but it gives you a lot of insight into how the rest of the tech community works. We are viewed as ID 107s and PEBCACs by the folks who wrote that documentation. So that is what you're going to run into when you step outside of the safe haven of the Mac community. It's not so bad in some places. Like if you're going out to, um, oh geez. Oh, why am I forgetting the name of it? Um, website with the crowdsourced answers. Stack Overflow. Yes, Stack Overflow, thank you. Um, so Stack Overflow isn't too bad, but if you venture into different parts of, say, Freenode, it can get ugly. So document troubleshooting you did before you reach out to the community. Match it to the tone of the community. And too much data is better than not enough. If you're going to come in and say, I'm having a really hard time binding to my Linux Samba Active Directory, make sure you document what you've already done. If you don't, you will get harangued by people going, did you do this, this, and this, and this? Did you do this? Did you do that? Why haven't you done all of these things? Come on, are you such a noob? So document what you did before you reach out. Also, remember the internet is global. If you are working with an international project, there is a high likelihood that there will be people who are English as a second language speakers. Also, there are huge cultural differences. I have been amazed by the interesting English as a second language emails I have gotten as a support engineer. You will also start to pick up, if you work with certain groups, their weird eccentricities. So in British Portuguese, it's never, I have a problem. It's always, I have a doubt. <laughs> and it makes you laugh every time you see it. But it's like, okay, there's a problem. Something's broken. Let's see what we can do to fix it. All right, moving onward, coping with hardware issues. If you support large numbers of Macs, get a GSX account or be BFFs with your local Apple store. Also, with servers, 
get service contracts at, at all possible. Having on-site support is cheaper and having a service window is so much less painful than having to keep all the parts on hand. Dell will show up and fix your server if it breaks and you don't have to worry about it. Printers, if you have large high-end printers, lease from a company, do not buy them. That way, if anything breaks, they have to come out and fix them because they want to keep charging you for the amount of toner that you're using. It's so much easier to call Xerox or your copier company in to get it fixed than it is to spend a day tearing it apart yourself. Also, if you haven't ever been covered in toner, it's really disgusting and gross. Everything else, either buy for quality or buy for ease of replacement and have spares if you go on the cheap side. And now we enter the final phase, general advice and final thoughts. So general advice, if you don't know very much command line, learn enough to be dangerous. You should definitely know disk util, software update, purge, kill all. These are incredibly handy. If you are unfamiliar with them, I highly recommend looking into them. Um, RM, LS, CD, Chonch, Mod, MV, and CP are universal. The ones before are only in OS X. Once you master those, you can pretty much work on any Linux or Unix box that you run into. And knowing how to use top, if you can't necessarily get a GUI brought up, is going to be incredibly handy. That will actually tell you what's running. Finding balance. Find your personal balance between chaos and order. Try to maintain it. And understand it um, and be okay with the fact that you will lose balance sometimes. No one is perfect. No one is some sort of magical gyroscope who can always be in balance. You will fall down. You will scrape your knees. You will descend the horrible steps of burnout. It will happen. It's just a fact of life. Have a life outside of work. Have friends. Have family. Have pets. Make sure you don't just live at work. If you start living at work, if you eat your lunch at your desk constantly, you will start shutting down. You will just fall apart. If that starts to happen, get out, get vacation. You're starting to burn out. Don't do it. Document most all of the things. For internal documentation, have your coworkers review it. For user-facing documentation, have a median skilled user review those. Do not shoot for the bottom of the barrel users, shoot for the middle. If you shoot for the middle, the folks in the top will be fine, the folks in the middle will be fine. For the folks down in the bottom 10%, they will probably be coming to you anyway because they're already your best friends. Have a support network. If you're working in a team, make sure there's mutual assistance as the norm, not the exception. Do not have folks be standoffish if you can help it. Have backup from your supervisors and ensure that you have sufficient authority if you need to put your foot down. And if you're getting thrown under the bus, try to find out why and or get out. And before we go to Q&A, I want to say thank you. Um, I would not be standing up here if it wasn't for how wonderful this conference was last year and how friendly and open the rest of the Mac community has been. It has been mind blowing. It's also a little bit terrifying to go from being a lurker in the community a couple of years ago to suddenly being someone who gets to come up here and stand in front of you and talk or work with Rich Der Flounder File Vault Trouten and giving a session on peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. It just, it blows my mind. So thank you, everyone. And we can either go to questions and comments or I can give you a talk on science fiction that I did before. <laughs> If you do have questions, please do step up to the microphone. Don't be shy. It's entirely anonymous. They will hear your voice. They will not see your face. If you have terrible experiences, you can come up and ask about them or just complain. We will listen. No? Oh, yeah, when the senior execs start getting your phone number and calling you on Christmas, that's just, yeah, it's never good. Yes? So if you find yourself in an environment where you're pretty much alone um, and nobody can really help you because mm -hmm. either nobody cares about Max or they just don't have the knowledge to begin with, mm -hmm. how do you try to combat that, try to get some help? Is there anyone who appears to be Mac or Linux curious? 
On the help desk level, yes, but not on my team. Okay. How far separated from the help desk are you? Uh, tier one, tier three. Okay. As someone who got picked up as a tier one support person and kind of brought under the wing and brought into the client systems administration side, if there is someone on your help desk who's curious about it, talk to whoever is directly managing them and be like, hey, so is it okay if I borrow person A over here for a little bit so that they can come help me? They really wanna learn more and I wanna help them advance my, their career and offload some of the easier work to them. There's a high likelihood they can image things, right? If yeah, so they're not already doing it. Yeah, so interested and try to nurture that. Yeah, if so I can. give it a shot. The worst thing that will happen is folks will say no. That may happen, but you never know until you try. And just bringing as much compassion and kindness as you can to everyone else will start to unnerve them, and they will eventually give up on being mean. So like, bribe them with cookies. Or alcohol, if that works better in your environment. Whatever works. Just soften the other people up. If you get them a little bit softer, if you break through some of the like, ew, no, Max, yuck, gross. We don't want to deal with Max. It helps. Yeah, alcohol and video games. Those yeah, are the two bribers, yeah. Exactly. So if that's what it takes, do it. It works.